Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all well and looking forward to today's webinar. My name is Tamar and I am from the VWB events team. If you have any technical issues today, please try and disconnect and re-enter the session. Um, alternatively, please make sure you put something in the chat box and not the Q&A box below. Um, there will be a time for Q&As towards the end of today's webinar. Um, please make sure they are in the Q&A box um, and we will aim to get through as many as possible. Just so you're aware, this session is being recorded and we will aim to get a copy of the recordings along with the slides over to you in the next few days. So please keep an eye on your inbox for that. If you have any other questions, please drop me a message in the chat box and I will now pass you over to our speakers today. Thanks very much and good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the webinar. So um, we're going to look at um, tribunal litigation and particularly with the lens around how um, claims may be settled. Um, I think we've all experienced over the last year as we've come out of lockdown and the pandemic that employment relations seem hard. There's quite a lot of um, um, concern in the workplace at times. And we certainly as a team have seen more litigation in the last um, 12 to 18 months than, than we've seen in, in the past. And that seems to be a continuing trend at the moment. So we're, we're just going to look at tribunal litigation in the context of how you might resolve disputes. Um, I'm joined today by my colleague, Lorna Scunny, who spends a lot of her time um, and is a very experienced tribunal litigator. So between us, we'll look at some of the themes around how we uh, manage tribunals and how we manage the um, settlement process. Um, so we'll look at some of the tactics around how we can help perhaps enhance settlement terms in terms of getting to an acceptable position. Um, and this rather follows on from the previous webinar we did last month, um, hosted by Alison Cook and Simon Martin, around looking at um, resolving disputes in the workplace. And obviously, um, that doesn't always happen. As I say, employee relations can be quite hard at times and um, people's expectations can't be met in the workplace. And it may well be that you end up with tribunal proceedings either while someone's employment continues in the discrimination forum or on the end of employment. And so we're just going to look again at um, the wider context of dispute resolution if proceedings have been issued. So um, a quick overview. I just make sure my mention is in the right place. There we go. Um, quick overview of the areas we're going to cover today. So we're going to look at um, why you should consider settling a claim, um, the, the early dispute resolution um, context in an employment tribunal and some of obviously um, how a, a tribunal process influences settlements. Um, a lot of you will be familiar with ACAS and we're just going to touch on again how that can be helpful in a dispute resolution process, how dealing with the um, employment tribunal um, claim in itself can be a helpful way of just trying to get to the number of the issues and look at um, the settlement issues. Um, again, how case case management can help and then some practical strategies to trying to bring those strands together as to how we can look at that resolution. So taking the first of those in terms of why you might consider settling a claim. Um, and I think the wider context um, for this for me is the fact that if you're settling a claim, you may be unhappy about the settlement terms. Ultimately, it's an element of compromise um, on both sides generally in terms of settlement, but you have retained control of the process. If you um, can't get a resolution, um, then ultimately you will go to a tribunal hearing and that tribunal hearing is where you give up control of the process and the decision making because essentially a third party, the tribunal is going to be asked to make the decision for you. Um, and that's what introduces an element of, of litigation risk. And it may well be that that's the right decision for the organisation and for you that the tribunal needs to decide an issue or be seen to be deciding it. But for the majority of cases, I think a hearing is the last resort and very much um, the, the opportunity to resolve a case is still a time where you uh, retain control of um, how that case is brought to a conclusion. So as I've got on the slide, the, the sort of usual motivations for thinking about um, settlements are around cost. There are, um, if you instruct lawyers, inevitably legal fees um, attached with, with those, and they can be substantial depending on type of claim um, and the issues involved. Managing tribunals is time consuming, um, and 
there is also quite an emotional cost on those who are involved in it. It is a stressful process, both in terms of dealing with tribunal deadlines and the hearings, as well as then getting to the hearing and the prospect of seeing a colleague or a former colleague across the table in a tribunal room is always a stressful thing. So I think not to be under uh, uh, um, anticipated in terms of the emotional as well as the time um, costs that um, are experienced by the organisation. There's some reputation issues, and this then goes again back to the control. Ultimately, a tribunal hearing is a public hearing, and it may well be that the issues being aired are internally damaging to the organisation, as in you don't want those issues shared more widely with colleagues, um, and or potentially externally. Um, uh, it, the reputation issue and a consideration. We, we now have an online tribunal decision database, um, and so all decisions of um, employment tribunals will appear on that database including those where the case has been withdrawn. So if it, generally the case is withdrawn, the decision is that it's dismissed or withdrawal. Um, that's a order of the tribunal and ultimately it's a decision that would appear on that database. So again, um, there's some just thinking through as to um, exactly what the reputation issues are. Ultimately though, tribunals are just a matter of em employ <laughs> employing people and the fact that you can't can't get everything right all the time or please everybody all of the time and um, tribunal proceedings are a fact of, of life in that context so I don't think you should fight shy of it but should absolutely depending on the, so the subject matter of a particular tribunal be aware of um, how it's reported what hearings can be public and um, whether that has an impact on reputation or particular issues both internally and and externally um, and then obviously there's an evaluation of the claim as to whether what you think the prospects of the claim are, how confident you are around witnesses, evidence, etc., um, and then um, legal advice as well around the merits of it will be exactly the right decision for the organisation that you've made, but there might be a legal challenge as to whether that's something that might be criticised in tribunal. So there's always the balance of the business decision making and the business rationale, and perhaps the the, the legal framework in which that that has been made, and whether that could seem to be. Uh, a challenge. Um, and then I suppose the final bit of um, considering settling a claim is then, and we'll come to this in a bit more detail later, is whether early resolution is good or whether actually you need to go through some of this process and be seen to be defending a claim or thinking about a claim um, before you actually get to the point of resolution. But we'll look at that in a bit more detail with Lorna in a second. Um, so if you've um, Starting to think about a settlement strategy, um, obviously there are a number of things that we would suggest you look at in terms of the parameters um, of that. When, when setting the parameters, I would say that um, obviously you may well need buy-in of stakeholders within the organisation or, or more widely in terms of someone, uh, people being happy that you're going to settle a claim or going to consider settling and the profile of a tribunal generally in, in an organisation internally. Um, and you're going to want a framework and you're going to want to know how you're going to manage it both in terms of the proceedings and potentially how you might resolve it the other thing i would just say is whilst absolutely you should have some parameters just be careful not to make them too hard and fast at an early stage if people put red lines in very early on as in i will not settle this claim for more than a thousand pounds or i'm definitely not it makes it harder for everyone concerned later so just be careful if you can in terms of how you just manage those responses to the parameters and aware it's, a, it's ultimately going to be another management decision and we all know that we might start in one place in making a management decision and end up in a slightly different place at the end. So just, just think about your parameters and how they're presented if you are looking at them setting those out on the settlement. But, and obviously what will inform that is the, the value of the claim. Um, are there any knockout points? Are there any points you can take in terms of jurisdiction? Um, are there any concerns or risks around codes of practice relating to ACAS or EHRC in terms of, um, if you like, best practice requirements. And this again comes back to um, business decisions compared to the, the legal framework at which they might be viewed. Um, so what are the claimant's prospects of success? Um, what's the litigation risk in terms of what's your best and worst case scenarios? Um, there's a litigation risk in every case. There is always the risk that a tribunal would not agree with you um, in terms of the decision making you went through, that um, witnesses um, may well have lapses of memory, 
um, they well find themselves through cross-examination being asked to agree with something that they find it hard to disagree with um, in the in, in the tribunal forum in terms of how facts are put to them um, in that forum. So there are all sorts of things that can influence the tribunal's decision. Ultimately, they're being asked to look at quite often what's a, a reasonable outcome, um, and therefore they take a lot of um, factors into into account. Um, if you are looking at settlement, then part of that may be to look at um, do you have an opening position, which may well be that there is no settlement offer or it's a low settlement offer because you're trying to save costs at the beginning of a matter and you're prepared to invest some of that in resolution. It may or may not be helpful at this stage to also set a maximum offer. You'll be getting some advice if you've instructed lawyers as to the potential costs of a tribunal so you'll know they can be a significant investment of both time and money. Um, and it, it will be that um, um, the discussion happens at an early stage as to, so is a sum of money to be paid, is it better to pay it to the claimants at an early stage and have resolution and control of the process, or because of the issues concerned or because of the nature of the claimants, is it is it going to be a case where you have to pay the legal fees and get further on into the tribunal proceedings before you can get to a settlement? Um, Importantly, you may or may not have insurance, and obviously it's useful to know at an early stage the extent to which any fees um, um, will be insured, and um, any conditions around that, and um, whether you have to use certain panel firms for certain insurance policies, or whether there's a contribution to be made to legal fees from an insurer um, um, more widely. And I think, um, as I say, in terms of thinking about resolution, try not to get any hard lines, but do think about your stakeholder engagement on a wider basis. What is the profile of the tribunal internally? Some of them are routine for you. There'll be quite a lot of them. And unfortunately, it's always can be business as usual. Um, at other times, they're higher profile, either because of the person or because you don't have very many tribunals. And lots of people may well have a view on it. So um, how do you just marshal those and have a consistent view that's a fair representation of what it is you're dealing with? And more widely, depending upon the sectors you work in, you may well have um, public sector um, statutory um, powers and guidance and or rules that you need to just consider. Um, obviously, in a charity, there will be um, charity commission obligations and guidance around use of charitable funds. And there may well be wider regulatory environmental um, issues as to whether you should be settling something or seem to be settling something and using a settlement agreement or or the circumstances and how you pull that settlement together. Um, and, and so things like EBS and safeguarding may well be relevant in certain environments. So that's really just an introduction and a context in which you might start to look at that. So, um, and we, we I touched on ACAS at the beginning. So Lorna's gonna pick up now, taking us into a bit more detail over the various strands of how matters to settle things. Lorna. Thanks, Gareth. So, um... Early conciliation is often the first opportunity to try and settle a potential claim. So it, for those who aren't familiar, is a free conciliation service and it's mandatory in the majority of claims and it's designed to help uh, reduce the number of claims going into the tribunal system. Essentially, before a claimant can present a claim to the Employment Tribunal, they must have notified their potential claim to ACAS and this can be done very easily online by putting a few details into a form and then an ACAS conciliator will contact the claimant to try and get some more details of their claim. And assuming the claimant has expressed an interest in uh, early conciliation, then ACAS will make contact with the prospective respondent to see if they're also interested in trying to resolve the claim. Now, it is open to a claimant to say that they're not interested in settlement, at which case ACAS will just issue a certificate. But in the majority of cases, um, the claimant will, will uh, express an interest in settlement and then uh, ACAS will, will um, contact the respondent to try to settle the claim. So the standard window for early conciliation is now six weeks. And during that period, the standard time limit for submission of a claim um, will be suspended, stopped. Essentially, the, the, the clock is stopped. And that's usually three months, so extended by six months. So if, uh, as an employer, you are um, contacted by ACAS Early Conciliation, you've really got two main options. Either you can simply state that you uh, don't think you've done anything wrong, you're not interested in settlement and not engage with the process, or you can, um, you can uh, engage in the process. 
tactically um taking the first option might be appropriate if you think the claimant is just trying it on and that there's no basis to their claim but in the majority of cases it would at least be sensible to take the opportunity to try and understand from ACAS what the potential claim is so that you can do a preliminary assessment of the merits and potential quantum of the claim and make a more informed decision about whether or not you want to um, consider settlement so it's a really good opportunity to try to understand not just what the claimant's claim is, but what they're looking for in order to resolve the dispute. And sometimes um, that might just be financial settlement, but sometimes it can involve um, things other than money. For instance, they might be looking for an agreed reference to help them um, find new work, or they might be upset about the way they've left and they'd be looking for some wording for an agreed announcement to be made internally or or externally in relation to their departure. And sometimes they might be after reinstatement or re-engagement. So um, if you can reach settlement terms with ACAS through early conciliation, then ACAS will help facilitate the settlement by way of a COP3 settlement agreement. And the advantage of this over a standard settlement agreement is that the prospective claimant doesn't have to go away and take legal advice on the settlement agreement, which also means that you as an employer don't need to contribute towards the costs of them taking legal advice. And it's also binding from the point that it's um, settlement terms are verbally agreed via ACAS, which can be helpful if you've got a slightly um, more difficult claimant who's a bit trickier to pin down in terms of, of settlement terms. So uh, it's also important to remember that all discussions with ACAS during early conciliation and indeed uh, at any later stage will be without prejudice, which means they can't be referenced by the claimant in support of their claim. So it is really a good opportunity to get to understand the claimant's claim, enable that early assessment of merits and quantum, and then to present the employer's position. Uh, and if you do assess that there's some merits in the claimant's claim, or if you establish that the value of the claimant's claim is um, such that actually it probably makes commercial sense to settle now, um, then the benefit of settling through early conciliation is obviously that you, you get that early settlement and av avoid the costs that are going to be incurred later if a claim is submitted and you have to defend it. Uh, and actually, um, ACAS um, early conciliation has proved very successful. That sort of assistance from a neutral third party um, does seem to be very helpful in, in promoting resolution. And so I do now have a little question for you as to, to see if you can assess what you think, uh, how successful ACAS are in terms of um, success at early conciliation state. So hopefully you can all read that question if we're slightly in your view it says ACAS received 105,000 early conciliation notifications in the year to July 2023 um, how many of these cases do you think reached agreement through ACAS early conciliation so answer A is 27,000 B 54,000 C 72,000 or D 98,000 please do vote Oh, I think some of you are voting on chat. There should be a poll up now for you to pop your answer actually directly into the poll, I think. It looks like we have poll not yeah. working. No, 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 it is working. Yeah, no, people have voted. Um, we can maybe just bring the poll to an end. And shall we share the results? Uh, there we go. Brilliant. So, in fact, uh, the majority of you are actually correct. It is answer C72,000. Um, were resolved through early resolution. Um, which reduced the demand on the employment tribunal and according to ACAS delivered up to 100 million pounds in savings to the taxpayer and of those claims that did then um, progress to tribunal stage uh, ACAS helped another 77 percent reach a resolution which means that actually only nine percent of the claims that were notified to ACAS via early conciliation actually progressed to an employment tribunal hearing so very successful and uh, I think you can imagine how overloaded the tribunal system would be without them. <laughs>
Some might so, say it's overloaded anyway, Lorna. So um, <laughs> interesting to see the stats, isn't it? Because it, it feels is. like the um, tribunal is full of um, claims all the time. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and then if I can move on to the next slide, please. Okay, there we go. Fabulous. Thank you. So, uh, however, obviously, um, however successful it is, sometimes early conciliation isn't con isn't successful. And uh, if it's not, and then you um, receive notification from the tribunal of a claim, then the next step will be to respond to the claim. And you will have 28 days from the date that the claim was sent to you in order to do that. Um, so there is still the possibility of exploring settlement via ACAS um, once the claim has been submitted before you actually submit a response. Um, but once you get that claim, it's now um, and you're preparing a response, it's now a really good time to do a more detailed assessment of the quantum and merits of the claim. Now, the quality of pleadings do vary, um, particularly if you're dealing with a litigant in person, it can still actually be quite difficult to understand exactly what um, they are claiming. But in most cases, hopefully it should be relatively clear and, uh, and, and preparing your response is your opportunity to set out your defence. And from a tactical perspective, uh, in order to put you in the best negoti negotiating position, it's important that you submit a thorough and robust defence, setting out clearly your position. This means clarifying where facts are disputed or not accepted and explaining why from a legal perspective you consider you're not liable for their claims. It's also helpful to point out any jurisdictional issues. So if you think that the claim or any element of it has been brought out of time, uh, if you think any elements of the claim are unclear, you should point that out and ask for clarification. Uh, and if you think that any elements of the claim have little or no reasonable prospect of success, then it's also sensible to point that out and explain that you'll be applying for strikeout or a deposit order in respect of those elements of the claim. And it's also really important to plead um, compensation uh, in your response. So if, for instance, you're arguing polky, which is to say that had, you know, you had a fair process been followed, uh, the outcome would have been the same, which would result in reduced compensation or in a um, conduct dismissal case, if you're going to plead that the claimant's conduct contributed towards their dismissal and that their um, compensation should be reduced on that basis. It's also sensible to set that out in order to, to manage the claimant's expectations in, in terms of the arguments you'll be running, particularly in relation to settlement to some. Um, if I could just move on to the next slide, please. Thanks. So once the response is submitted, the case will then need to be prepared for final hearing. And this often uh, involves a preliminary hearing in order to clarify the issues and to set directions for preparations leading up to the hearing. Um, and in some cases, it might also involve um, you making an application for um, a postponement or for strikeout or um, for a deposit order. Um, sometimes a stay in proceedings is necessary, um, particularly if you're dealing with an area of law that's not settled and you're maybe waiting for a more senior court to issue a judgment on that point, or sometimes because of um, the health, um, particularly um, in disability discrimination cases, sometimes um, cases are postponed because of the claimant's health. Uh, and it's important that you factor these case management tools into your settlement strategy. Um, generally speaking, where the issues in the claim are immediately clear from the claim and the response, then it's it's often possible to start your settlement negotiations at that stage if that's what you want to do. Um, but in some cases, if the um, claim is not not, not clear, as I say, um, particularly if you're dealing with litigants in person, then it may be um, impractical to try and commence settlement discussions until until a preliminary hearing has been held and the um, and the issues have been clarified. Um, if you're considering making applications for strikeout or deposit order, it's sensible to consider when the best time to make those applications are. You don't want to incur the costs of making an application at, at a point which they're unlikely to succeed. But at the same time, if you do have applications pending, then that's probably a good time to be uh, looking to negotiate settlement because um, uh, it's a good bargaining tool if the claimant is thinking that they're at risk of having their um, claim struck out or having to pay a deposit, then they're, they're much more likely um, 
to accept a lower settlement at that point than they might be afterwards if your application has failed. But obviously making these applications and attending these hearings is likely to incur more costs for you as a respondent. So really what you need to be doing is balancing the um, the, the costs involved in making these applications and the, the additional bargaining strength that it might give to you. Um, and uh, really what I would say is that in many cases, settlement discussions are more of a, an art than a science. And what you need to be doing really continually is reassessing the merits of your claim, the potential quantum of the claim and balancing these against the costs that are going to be incurred in defending the claim. So it's important to remember that in most cases, costs incurred in defending tribunal proceedings won't be recoverable, even if you successfully defend the claim. So uh, unless you were defending the claim on principle, which which you might well be doing because you don't want to set a precedent that you're uh, an employer that will routinely settle spurious claims because that can risk uh, encouraging more weak and spurious claims to follow. But unless we're in that scenario, in most cases, settlement may well be the most cost effective solution because the sum that you're going to be able um, to settle it for is likely to be less than the costs that are likely to be incurred if you defend the claim all the way through to the full hearing. So from a settlement perspective, if you're if you're interested in exploring settlement, the aim really is going to be ensure that you settle it at the most appropriate time uh, in the most cost, cost effective way. Um, so important to remember then when, when you're considering um, settlement sums that um, unless the claimant is litigant in person, they're also going to be incurring costs throughout the process. And even if they are litigant in person, they'll still be spending considerable amounts of time in um, bringing their proceedings. And it's also um, very stressful, particularly for a litigant in person, to pursue a tribunal claim. And so those factors can be used to help leverage settlement discussions. So thanks, Gareth, for anticipating that. Um, so the first direction that a tribunal is likely to make in any tribunal claim will be for the claimant to provide a schedule of loss. Now, hopefully, when you receive that schedule of loss, it won't be a surprise to you because you'll already have done uh, a quantum assessment. And so you should have a, a fair idea what the likely value of the claim is going to be. But in some cases, and particularly when you're dealing with litigants in person, claimants can be wildly unrealistic about their um, settlement expectation, the value of the claim. Um, and it's, so it's important um, to get that schedule of loss so you can assess their expectations. And then even if there are no directions for a counter schedule of loss, and quite often that the directions for a counter schedule of loss don't come until much later in the day, if you get an unrealistic schedule of loss, it's really helpful to prepare your own counter schedule of loss so you can send that back to the claimant. So to help manage their expectations as to a realistic value of their claim. Um, and then in terms of um, compensatory award, it's also um, helpful to remember that the claimant will be under a duty to mitigate their losses. And that means that they must be ready, willing and able to work, actively seeking new employment and claiming appropriate benefits. And it's important um, to remind the claimant of this um, and to, to try to establish if they have found new work and to push for disclosure of their evidence on mitigation. And if that isn't provided um, and you have to go to a tribunal, you can ask a tribunal to draw inferences from the fact that they've provided no evidence of mitigation and to reduce their award accordingly. Um, and obviously, if you do establish that they've got a new job, then you need to be able to reassess the value of their claim in light of that, because obviously if their losses have stopped, the value of their claim will be fixed. And sometimes you might find that even the strongest of claim can actually have very little value um, and therefore it, it might be more cost effective to settle uh, in those circumstances. So at the point of disclosure, it's important that you um, assess merits and quantum again and again at the point at which you're taking witness statements and then again following exchange of witness statements when you've once you've got the claimants um claimants version of final witness statement to to assess on so in most cases the taking and preparing of witness statements is likely to be the most time consuming part of the process and therefore 
the part that's likely to incur the most costs. So if, um, as a respondent, you're keen to settle, um, it's often important to, to try and really make a concerted effort to do so before um, witness statements are, are prepared. It's also important to consider the timing then of taking the witness statements because often you'll want to delay that to give you time to settle but there are cases where actually there's very little documentary evidence and witness evidence is crucial um, in assessing the merits and in those cases it might actually be prudent to take your witness statements early on in order that you can then accurately assess merits at an early stage to enable you to make an informed settlement um, strategy. It's also important to factor in uh, the disruption that defending a claim through to final hearing will have on the business, uh, particularly in lengthy hearings, even with um, careful timetabling, witnesses may be required to attend tribunal for several days, which can impact negatively on the business um, and may therefore increase pressure to settle. Uh, it's also important to bear in mind that in some cases you might have witnesses who leave an organisation between the time the claim is presented and the claim gets to hearing and so in some cases those those witnesses might be reluctant to come along and then attend a hearing after they've left and if that's the case then obviously the lack of a key witness um, can also impact negatively on merits and again it's important then to re reassess and if necessary um, that might increase pressure to settle. So those are some of the considerations and I'm going to hand you back now to Gareth. So if you are considering settlement to look at the kind of strategies you might want to consider. Great. Thanks, Lorna. Um, and I suppose as, a, as an overview of that, obviously you, you, you've thought about the issues, you thought about the tribunal. Um, and as, as Lorna has explained, the tribunal process will, will have various steps in it. Obviously, you can consider without prejudice discussions at any time in that process and obviously they can therefore run in tandem so you need to be very clear that any conversations you are having around settlement are without prejudice and normally they're also subject to contract as in they're, they're subject to then agreeing those terms in writing um, at a later date it's not a binding settlement until those things have been achieved um, so you, you want to think about how you might do that as to whether as, as Lorna has said and the poll has shown ACAS have a good track record of helping um, with a bit of third party intervention, um, the parties resolve a dispute. Um, and we, we talked about the benefits of using a COT3. Um, sometimes ACAS can't get there or there's a, there's a solicitors are involved and it's, it's natural for solicitors to talk and um, for a settlement agreement to be used. Or it may well be that you have a process where you don't have dispute resolution and you have an in-house settlement agreement that you use on a, on a regular basis. So. Um, again, that will be on a without prejudice basis, and obviously will need to be tailored to the dis to the dispute. Um, um, and quite often, if there is a discussion of a settlement agreement, it can be quite helpful to be volunteering the agreement fairly early on, so people just can see the overall package and the overall um, what's being proposed. Um, in some cases, parties just feel too far apart, or there feel to be too many issues, so you might just focus on wanting to get to a a resolution before you introduce the wording of an agreement. So again, be on a case by case basis before you do that. Um, and and you also just need to think through um, when you're looking to to negotiate a settlement, whether you want an overall settlement and take the approach that there's a it might well be various components to your settlement. So there's a if you like a, a basket of there might be some financial contribution. There might be agreement on references, announcements, um, outplacement support, etc. Um, if you do that by way of negotiating a settlement agreement, you can find that little things get picked off by the other side and there's always another ask. And it may well be sometimes as a tactic better to present the offer as a whole and say it is um, all, all for acceptance. Or and if you don't accept all of its terms, then it, there's no, no deal. So just try and keep everything in the round and, and keep things together rather than being picked off um, as you go. Um, Lorna has explained that generally costs don't follow the event in the employment tribunal and each side is responsible for their own costs, which is an important consideration. There can be very limited circumstances in which costs can be awarded, largely in these sort of contexts where someone is generally judged to be unreasonable in their conduct because there might be an outstanding um, offer which more than meets their expectations in terms of compensation or what's said in their schedule of loss. Um, the, the difficulty sometimes with those is that um, a claimant, is, let's say it's an unfair dismissal claim, is entitled to litigate to get a finding of being unfairly dismissed. 
so um, generally offers are made without admission of liability, so without conceding that point, and they may therefore have limited um, impact in terms of um, making representations about costs later if ultimately a claimant pursues a claim that doesn't beat the offer that you put in place in terms of um, saying what's reasonable as a resolution. Um, and if they argue that that's because they wanted a determination around um, the fairness of a dismissal or a finding of discrimination, it may well be that that would still be a reasonable course of conduct. But the armory is there and it does clarify the mind and get people to focus on things in terms of where where costs are potentially um, an issue in those. And obviously, there's the wider issues around costs where someone is perhaps being unreasonable in the way in which they're conducting the litigation. Sometimes, in terms of a strategy, it, you know it's a nuisance claim or you, you think it's without merit um, and costs are potentially going to be an issue because obviously if someone withdraws a claim, the other side can make an application for costs that they've incurred in defending the case until it's withdrawn. And so sometimes um, if, if that's being talked about, it's helpful to have a, a drop hand settlement or proposal where um, essentially employees agree not to pursue the, the, the application for costs if the um, claim is withdrawn. So. Um, again, depending on how that's positioned, it's sometimes a useful way of clarifying the mind that someone can't just bring tribunal proceedings and just, just continue them later without consequence, because there could be consequences in those circumstances, and the drop hands approach may be, may be appropriate. Um, so that's some of the, the wider tactics and some of the wider thoughts. Um, Lorna's now going to take us to um, thinking about some of the timing of that. Um, Thanks, Gareth. So, I mean, generally speaking, in terms of um, timing of offers, obviously, if you can um, make an offer and get things settled before significant legal fees have been incurred, that's going to, in most cases, be most cost effective. But this really has to be balanced against the ability to make an accurate assessment of the merits and quantum of the claim. And in some cases, you might find that continuing with the claim will enable you to um, assess that actually there's very little merit to it and that it, it uh, therefore could be settled at a much lower value or indeed it, that you could persuade the claimant to withdraw the claim or um, you might be successful in getting it struck out by the tribunal in the early stages so um it's it, as I said, it really is just a, a continual um, balancing exercise that requires you to to continually reassess as new evidence comes to light, and also as the pro, as the tribunal process proceeds, when new hearings come in, you, you have to readjust your cost assessment and that kind of thing. So, um, but the key points I would say to to be reassessing would be at disclosure and um, when taking and exchanging witness statements. Um, also, in terms of timing, um, I suppose if you're if you're keen to, to to settle, if you start settlement negotiations earlier, it does give you that time to maybe go in with a low offer um, within your agreed parameters that you should have sort of, as, as Gareth said, set out at the at the beginning, and it gives you then more time to negotiate, perhaps increase incrementally with the hope that ultimately you might be able to secure a lower settlement. Whereas if you leave settlement discussions um, to a point shortly before you're about to incur significant costs, then you may need to go in at a higher level in order to secure settlement um, before those, those costs are uh, incurred. Um, I would also say that if you're going to make a best and final offer, you don't throw away, sort of throw the term around lightly, because if you make a best and final offer and it's rejected, and then you have to go in again with a higher offer in order to settle, it sort of undermines your position a bit. Um, so, so don't use that term likely um if you are making an offer it is um generally um helpful to attach a deadline following which the offer will automatically be withdrawn if it hasn't been accepted um this is helpful in sort of keeping proceedings and negotiations moving and it also helps uh, ensure that an offer isn't left on the table for acceptance at a point um where merits subsequently may have changed which would make that offer no longer appropriate um but if you are um, imposing deadlines, then uh, it is um, careful, or you need to be careful to remember not to impose um, too short a deadline, which could be viewed as oppressive um, and open you up to a, a cost order. Um, and 
one thing I would say that we sometimes find helpful, particularly if you're dealing with a litigant in person who's got very unrealistic expectations in terms of settlement, and so um, is just coming back with wildly unrealistic sums, is to try and encourage them to take legal advice on the settlement. And in fact, in some cases, um, uh, I've had clients who've actually offered to pay for the claimant to take legal advice, independent legal advice, so that they take that advice, because quite often if we tell them they're being unreasonable, they think that that's just us being the opposition and, and, and not being accurate. But if they go off and take their own independent legal advice, um, that can that can certainly help manage their expectations. So that's always something to consider. Um, and then if I could move on to the next slide, please. Um, and then the other thing to consider when making settlement offers is also um, that uh, to, to remember that if you're um, agreeing settlement terms, then you can include a number of things within those terms that a tribunal wouldn't be able to award as remedy if the claim succeeded. So in particular, we touched on this earlier, in many cases, something like an agreed reference will be uh, important to the claimant. And <laughs> one thing that uh, they quite often ask for also is an apology. Um, obviously, we tend always to ensure that settlement is um, done without admission of liability. And generally speaking, um, a, a, an apology isn't appropriate as part of settlement terms but if an employer is being pragmatic then a carefully worded statement of regret can be helpful in securing um settlement at a much uh, lower value than would otherwise be um be required and there are other things that you can include that sometimes claimants will will find helpful so you you could include within settlement terms that you know that that you'll um agree to arrange for retraining of certain employees or revise a policy that they found was oppressive. So if it's a sort of principle argument that they're taking, then those things can be helpful. Um, and also um, settling from an employer's uh, perspective also in, enables you to impose terms that you wouldn't get from the tribunal as well. So obviously you can um, include confidentiality provisions within certain um, parameters. You can't obviously prevent things like um, protected disclosures um uh but you could um a, a one thing that we do sometimes find is it, particularly if there's it being a subject access uh, request but in it's going to be particularly expensive or time consuming to deal with you can include settlement with um withdrawal of a request um of that type and the other thing um obviously uh to remember though is that there are certain limits within what you can agree in terms of um those settlement terms, particularly in certain regulatory environments. So if you are in a in a schools of charity environment, um, you may not be able to um, agree certain things in in an agreed reference. Um, and similarly, you may have reporting requirements that you you shouldn't be able to uh, to promise that you won't make reports that you you, you obviously otherwise should make. So there are limits. But um, so yes, those are the types of concessions that that can be helpful in in securing settlement. And now I'm going to pass back to Gareth, who's going to just talk to you a little bit more about dispute resolution in the tribunal. Thanks, Lorna. Um, so we, we're just coming to the end of the formal part of our presentation, and we thought we'd just round things off by looking at the tribunal's approach and framework around resolution. So we've talked a lot about settlement strategy and how you can take the initiative with that, and how you can use. Um, um, ACAS to try and get to a resolution. Yeah, um, you'll also find if you participated in, in the employment tribunal process um, recently that there is an increasing um, um, proactivity from the tribunal as well in terms of can the case be resolved. So they will, um, and they they have a set to do one of their um, regu regulations. The rules around tribunals requires them to to ask about um, resolution um, rule three, and we now have some. Um, presidential guidance that was issued earlier this month that just summarizes the overall tribunal approach. Um, and there are essentially always four things that they want to look at in relation to any case. The first is understanding whether the tribunals have ac had access to ACAS, and they would always encourage that. You'll find if you go to a preliminary hearing, there'll be remarks about whether um, the parties have explored resolution through ACAS and whether they should continue to do so or be encouraged to do so if they haven't. Um, the the employment judge um, now also has a number of other um, things to consider, which are, are listed on this slide in relation to um, whether um, there is a way of looking at alternative dispute resolution 
and those are around looking at judicial mediation, judicial um, uh, assessments, and also dispute resolution appointments. And I'll just very quickly touch on each of those um, as to how they work, because um, um, they're all slightly different. So the judicial mediation is something that um, is largely looked at for cases that are going to be listed for three or four days or longer in terms of um, is it worth the input of a, a, an employment judge's time essentially for a day to look at whether they can mediate a dispute. Some tribunals you'll find if you're in central London, for example, now limit the judicial mediation to half a day. It's a real squeeze having done one of those, but they can be successful. They really do focus the mind in terms of how you approach a, a mediation and, and the issues that you talk about in that context. Um, but they essentially, they, they look for them to be consensual. So both parties have to agree to a mediation. Um, they're confidential, so they're not then referred to in the proceedings on the employment judge who may host the mediation or not be the judge who then hears the case if the mediation is not successful. And they're looking looked at being facilitative. So the judge is not giving a view unless asked, and in which case they might insert parameters, talk about the potential merits of a claim. But basically, they're just looking at facilitating a resolution. So taking into account everything we've talked about as to what's important to somebody, um, either on the employer or employee side, in terms of resolution. And I think it's probably worthwhile saying that in judicial mediations, yes, of course, the, le the legal merits are important as to why you find yourself in tribunal proceedings, but they aren't always the focus on a mediation day. It gets very much more around um, what, uh, how do you get the parties to get to a point where they both can agree to compromise probably end up a situation where nobody's happy, but um, you might say that's the hallmark of a good compromise in terms of um, everyone has given something in order to get concessions and get to a sensible place. Um, so that's the mediation environment and uh, an employment judge would generally have a bit of shuttle diplomacy taking part, it, going to one party than the other, swinging positions and looking for where movement can be. And it's really important that you prepare for those in advance by thinking about what is your maximum that you're prepared to go to, what are the other things, thinking creatively, the non-financial concessions that Lorna went through, and there may be others, particularly for a case that will really help with the value that you're offering in terms of a resolution. And don't underestimate, as I say, these, these letters of regret or uh, um, acknowledgements um, can have some real weight and some real thoughts because generally people who've got to this stage can feel quite frustrated with the legal process because they just see a denial of their claims and quite often might be some common ground where you're prepared to concede something. So the mediation process can, can help with, with that. Um, the, the next type of um, ADR that the tribunal process look at is um, a judicial assessment. Um, this is where they do give an assessment of the merits of the claim. Again, it needs to be consensual, so both parties agree to it. It's confidential, um, but it's, it's evaluative rather than facilitative. So they are giving a steer and giving a recommendation potentially as to the, the merits or otherwise in the case. Quite often you might find that they follow a preliminary hearing. So if there has been a discussion of the issues in the case and the merits um, as part of setting the timetable for um, preparing a case for hearing, then a judicial assessment may be appropriate in those circumstances. But um, a, the employment judge will take a view as to when and how to offer that. And then it's for both parties to say whether they're prepared to participate in it. Um, the, the, the final way, um, and this is probably something that's slightly newer and um, we're still getting scripts with, um, but now has been, been included in the presidential guidance, is whether the judge takes the view that they're going to hold a what's called a dispute resolution appointment. These are non-consensual, as in they can basically can be required to attend um, by order of the tribunal rather than being asked to attend in, in the consensual. Um, they are still um, confidential. But they are evaluative in terms of trying to um, get to the bottom of the merits of a case. And the idea is, again, that whilst someone could be required to attend such an appointment, they're not necessarily required to um, accept the, uh, the determination on the day and, and the, um, the, the view of the judge. But obviously that may well then have further implications for how they manage the tribunal going forward in the extent to which there are risk of costs um, if they don't accept that. That outcome. So it's a way of uh, perhaps in, in more difficult cases and in longer cases generally, um, the guidance suggests that they'll be used for those cases that listed for six days or more. And in those circumstances, um, maybe um, difficult discrimination issues or whistleblowing issues where there's a lot of 
um, legal arguments as well as evidence to get through. A judge may feel that it's appropriate to to um, host an appointment and try and um, get through to some of the issues again as a way of looking to get to a resolution. Um, so, um, as you'll see on the slide, the, the tribunals have reported so far in terms of um, the um, judicial mediation that their, their success rate generally is between 70 and 75 percent. People do view it because it's quite often near the end of the process, but one of the final steps. It can be before um, the final push to sort of the statements and, and get ready for a hearing because they generally are for the disclosure so people can see documents, can, can get a sense of the case. Um, but they they um, can be a really good investment of time in terms of then trying to get to the resolution of the case. Um, that brings us to the end of our um, formal um, presentation this morning. And so we're very happy to take any questions that anybody may have um, in relation to um, the issues that we've raised this morning or the approaches. Um, there was one that was asked earlier in relation to whether um, what the outcome of those the success rate of people bringing claims in tribunal once um, uh, if they do go to a hearing. I was trying to find the answer to that when someone asked it earlier. I couldn't visually find it, but I will find it. Basically, the tribunal service does report annually in relation to um, its um, um, number of cases it manages and the outcomes. So um, the, the statistics are available, but I would say generally more claims fail in tribunal to succeed and um, generally it's weighted towards the employer if you do get to the final hearing. But yeah, I was just trying to I was just trying to do exactly the same thing to, to find out. Uh, you get the number of cases disposed of, but it doesn't tell you um, whether they were successful or, or not really. And then there is um, details of the awards made, um, but it doesn't necessarily tally with quite the same period, so it's it's difficult to work out. But I th I think I think um, yeah I think Gareth's exactly right. I think it's only about twenty percent that actually succeed. Thanks, Lorna. And Thanks. Um, you might have a view on this next question as well. So um, the question is: Can you give an idea of timescales between ET one responses and actual hearing dates? They're asked this all the time, aren't they? How long are these processes taking roughly? Sorry, I, I didn't catch the question. Um, it says, can you give an idea of time scales between an ET1 response being mm -hmm. uh, uh, ET3, well, it says ET1 response, but ET3 response, so filing a response and then the actual hearing date? How long uh, are the processes taking? So it really depends on the tribunal and the type of claim. So I think if it's a straightforward, unfair dismissal claim, I had one recently where they'd notified, um, so we haven't even filed a response yet, uh, so they sent the claim, notice of claim, um, at the same time uh, as notifying us of the final hearing, which is actually set for November this year, but it's a one day simple unfair dismissal by CVP, Cloud Video Platform, so not in person, whereas anything that's got any element of discrimination in, they will generally list it for a preliminary hearing um, before listing it for a final hearing and they'll normally list it for a final hearing at the preliminary hearing once they've clarified the issues and worked out how long it's going to take. So with multi-day claims, they're normally being listed, I would say, probably about a year away in some of the quieter regions. And I think it's even longer than that in some of the busier regions, particularly in London. I think yeah. that's my experience as well. And sometimes it can take quite a long time to get to preliminary hearing. So you find you you file your response and there's quite a hiatus before you get to the preliminary hearing, which sets the directions and, and looks to set out the, the um, details of the case. Um, I think the longest we've waited is about eight months for a preliminary hearing, which is probably unusual. They're usually within two to three months, but that can therefore, I would generally say you're looking for 12 to 18 months for a final hearing. Um, if that if the case can't be resolved, so that's again another reason why settlement might be important. Um, um, memories fade, people move on, issues become less important. There's all sorts of reasons within the basically time being a healer, as well as just the um, the overall approach of, of and, and the listing availability of the tribunal um, to get to a final hearing. Okay, seems like we've hopefully. Um, covered most ground that people were expecting, so there aren't any further questions at the moment.
Um, we have one final poll for you, which is just to ask you to, to rate the webinar. Your feedback is really helpful to us, please, just in terms of making sure that we're delivering content that is useful. Um, and um, if you've got any other thoughts, then do drop us a line as to topics or, or areas you'd like us to cover. That'd be really helpful. Thank you. And thanks, thanks very much for joining us this morning. Thank you.